going to uh, um, uh, I'm going to uh, load all the things that we have done last time. Thanks again. Thank you very much. And <coughs> and what I will do um, uh, is adding the projects over here one by one, and we'll go through it. So <coughs> we'll go through the existing project, and I'm going to say I want from I want it to be from. NAA and the animal thingy, we're going to bring it up. First of all, let's uh, go with the standard thing. Uh, any questions? Today you're going to have, uh, we, I didn't put any questions on virtuals because I saw the number of questions is growing more and more. I got to 12 questions and I said stop, that's enough. So. We, in those questions, there we go. All right. In those questions, I didn't do that. <laughs> in those questions, we, um, in those questions, uh, the questions that you're going to get, we have uh, concept questions. A um, couple of them little, uh, are exact copies of, uh, so one of the questions are exact copies from the text that you read over there. And the rest of them are uh, concept questions based on what we talked about, all the things like when, when I say, I don't know, uh, motorcycle is a bicycle, what does, it, what does it mean? And I give you four choices, you would see select them, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the answer for the questions uh, becomes visible and your submission and stuff on Monday. The reason is that's because for people with accommodation and stuff like that, sometimes we, you need to uh, do stuff uh, later. Um, and uh, those people who have accommodation, automatically it will be added to your time. So when you, that's why we are studying from 9.15. So those people who do not have accommodation, the quiz ends at 9.30, which is exactly 15 minutes. But for those who do not do have accommodation, based on the amount of accommodation, they're going to continue doing it. Okay, so as soon as you see the, the quiz is over, you get out. And you don't talk, you don't say, what was the answer for the fourth question? You don't do that, right? You just get out, okay, to make sure that it remains silent. What else? <clears throat> oh, yeah, and uh, uh, I have three walkthroughs, okay? In the, uh, why the walkthroughs you see there uh, fill in the blanks, okay? Uh, so you have a blank thing. The walkthroughs only generate one line, okay? three characters, or one character, or one phrase, okay? Because it's a walkthrough, you cannot just type. If it says, for example, derived with capital D, you have to type over there, derived with capital D. If it's lowercase d and it's not exact match, because an, a walkthrough is supposed to be determined the exact output of the following, the exact output, you must exactly produce what is being printed over there. No virtuals, only... Uh, classes uh, and resources, and uh, inheritance, so week uh, six and eight. All right? Are we good? All right? All right. So, and yeah, so um, I don't know how many quizzes I can do. I may be able to do two more, or I may be able to do six more. So the more quizzes, the better, uh, and that's that. Uh, any questions about the quiz? And if, let me see if anybody's online at all. Nobody's online. Okay, let me just ask so what happened. Let me actually invite a good guest thingy over here. Okay, and I'm going to put that one in the, uh, actually, no, we don't need to. It's just, I'm just going to put it in the general one, too. So in here, I'm going to say, I put it in Microsoft Teams too. That's interesting. 
it does oh, oh there you go okay all right all right so that's that so we know that about quizzes and we have no problem hopefully with it are we okay everybody's okay all right so let's uh let's talk about what we've done last time um quickly going through this things that you did not know was uh, initially how to make uh, an instance of an object uh, truly global. We did not know that, and we learned it last time. That was the first thing. So uh, when I say creating a, a local inst uh, a uh, uh, an instance of an object, that means an integer, a Boolean, an employee, a student, whatever, okay? Uh, either instance of a class or uh, instance of a primitive variable how to make it truly global. Um, this, I don't think, is in the notes, okay? So um, make sure that you uh, learn it, okay? Uh, so to do that, first we have to create, to, to create a global uh, variable, a global instance, what we need to do is to first create a file scope variable. You can have that file scope variable within a namespace or just by itself. So what we did, we created uh, a a uh, file scope variable, and then we want to make that file scope variable global. In the header file of that file scope variable, we use the extern. So, oh, somebody, oh, there we go. If, if you're logged in, uh, yes, please, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, Mustafa is here, so Mustafa would be nice if you actually activate your microphone. So if I have a question, I can answer it. Anyways, uh, so, yeah. Oh, you're here? So you logged in from here? Why? <laughs> Just wanted to try it, I guess. He's logging in online from the lab. So that's for people who are not in class, but it's okay. You're fine. Um, so, yeah, so. Uh, that is that. So the next thing I wanted to, so, so yes, yeah, so, and then you go to the header file. So you go to the header file, and in the header file, you create, you put the exact same name and type of the variable, and you put an extern in from front of it. That becomes a prototype for that variable. It introduces it to all the other files who include that header file. So any file who includes that header file will have access to that file scope variable, essentially it becomes global. That, and I mentioned, that's exactly how you use C in and C out. All right, C in and C out, and we have, we have two more. What are the other two? C in, C out? C error, C log. C error, C log, okay? C error, C log, C out, they are three instances of the same object, and they have absolutely no difference. They just call them differently, so you can use them for different purposes. C out and C error are two instances of the object. Why did they do that? If something goes wrong with C out, you still have a chance to print an error message. Or if you are doing, or, and also because it's an object, you can disable the object. You can disable C out to stop printing. It's an object. So for example, you can use C log for your debugging messages, and then you can disable C log so your, error met, so your debug messages are not printed anymore. You can do stuff like that. We don't know how yet, but you'll find out soon. So uh, these four objects that we know they are global down to this point, these are exactly the same way. These are externed inside IO stream. And therefore, when you use IO stream, when you include IO stream, you have access to these four global variables. Um, any questions down to this point? We talked about classes. We said uh, we wanted to, we talked about inheritance, and for, uh, for inheritance, we actually use the animal uh, class and the animal class that we have. We came up with some, some imaginary thing uh, called animal that actually uh, uh, is used as a base class. So we use this base class animal that has specific type of specifications to uh, uh, demonstrate how uh, to demonstrate how inheritance works. 
So, for example, we said if we have an animal with these type of information, it has a name and it has a, uh, uh, it has, uh, it has a name and it can act and move and make a sound, um, and it has a, a, a query called name, uh, a query called name, and a modifier called name again. One returns the name and the other one. So they essentially provide access to the name. Um, and uh, um, I want that access to be limited to the children. That's why I use the, the protected uh, uh, access modifier. Therefore, uh, if I want to make a cat out of this one, we said that the syntax is that you say I want the derived class to be publicly inherited from the previous class, base class that I have. By definition, when you have something like that, it actually gets all the gains access to all the public and protected uh, stuff of the base class directly and indirectly access to its private properties. When I say indirectly is that when you uh, print the, the ad, it still prints the name, although you don't have access to change the name, but for example, through the constructor of the animal, you can set the name to whatever you want. So these type of things, uh, uh, remember, uh, the question came up that, so children have no access to the private uh, uh, properties of the base class, and the answer was no, they have access, but indirect access, like any other object that we have out there. So when you have an object and the object is using the class, they are using the private properties. The example was that when you are having a car, the engine of a car, the carburetor of the car, or the electric battery of the car, all those things are private properties of the, class, of the car. You cannot access them. But when you sit in a car, you have a public method called the gas pedal or the accelerator or throttle, whatever you call it. Through that, you can tell to the engine that is a private uh, part of the uh, car to go faster. So the car goes faster. Okay, so you always access, you always use the private properties of a class. So you can't say, I don't have access to private properties. You do have access to private properties, okay, of a class. But uh, that uh, private property is uh, uh, provided to you using the public accessors so you don't go bananas with the class. For example, my brain, you don't have access to it, but through my mouth, I am e extracting this information and giving it to you. You cannot just put electrodes in my brain and see what I think, right? I mention it to you. I choose to give you what's going on inside here. That's private, and my mouth is, that talks, is public. You can hear. Are we good? All right. All right. So that's that. So we learned that's how the, uh, uh, the what is the syntax, and we said the public Type uh, inheritance can be done in three different ways. You can publicly inherit, uh, inherit in a protected way or inherit in a private way. By protected and private, too rich for our blood. We don't care about it and we don't uh, think about it. By the way, start up the computer that is in front of you, lab computer, because that's the only place you can do the quiz from. Make sure it's ready when it's 9.15. You don't have time to boot it up and log in and stuff. So make sure the computer in front of you, the, the Seneca computer, not your laptop, okay? The Seneca computer is active and on, okay? And you are doing the quiz on that, all right? Uh, it, after the quiz is done, I check where you have got connected to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to do your quiz. If you did not ask for permission, for your special circumstances and you do the quiz from somewhere else, it's considered plagiarism. So if you do it from your computer, it's plagiarism. It has to be done with the computers of the lab. So remember that, okay? So log into Seneca, uh, my Seneca, and make sure it's ready at 9.15, we can just start. So yeah, so we said protected and pri uh, private type of inheritance, too rich for our blood, we do not need to talk about it. When I say, Protected and private are two rich for abroad only for inheritance, not the access modifiers. So the one that I'm saying cat publicly inherits animal, that's always public for us for this semester and probably next semester. All right? So we said 
every single function that you have in the child that has the exact, every single function that exists in the child, in the derived class, and has exact signature of the parent of the base, shadows it. What does it mean, shadows it? It means when you call that function, the f uh, when you have a derived classes instance, you call that function, it will hide, it will shadow the, uh, the parent one, okay? So whenever, like, like if they tell you what happens uh, when I override a class, when I override a function, what happens? It shadows it, okay? That's the terminology for it in, in uh, uh, C, C++. We say this function is shadowing the base function's uh, method because it has the same signature, okay? Unless we know what the theory, and we know all the good stuff. Uh, we're gonna go continue going on. If we do not uh, provide the same access as the parent, automatically the parents will be invoked. Okay, so you have the choice, like the act, to actually shadow the parent's class, or you have, a ch you have the choice of not touch it because you think the parent is good enough, or like sound, you can shadow the base class, but you can, inside, inside that function, you can actually use the parents, uh, uh, parents uh, method. To invoke a shadowed method, you have to, you have to use the scope resolution and the name of the base class. So in this case, if in the sound or anywhere inside the uh, derived class, I want to access directly a method of the parent, I have to put the name of the base class with scope resolution. In this case is animal scope resolution sound. Now, when I'm doing like this, I could call this sound in play. There is no problem with that. You can call it anywhere, but in this scenario, I gave something that is more uh, uh, possible. Uh, it's more frequent in an object-oriented design where you, when you over, uh, when you shadow uh, uh, a child, a, 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 um, a parent's method, you want you to, to still use the parent's method, but add few features to it. Therefore, inside the shadowed uh, um, method, you call the parent's method. <coughs> That's that. So that's the thing we talked about, okay? So that was uh, going through it and explaining what inheritance is. And also, for uh, we mentioned that in, uh, when you are dealing with, uh, uh, with, in, with uh, inheritance, in the inherited class, in the derived class, you may add extra functions that the place class did not have. In this case, we added the play, okay? <clears throat> we mentioned everything is good with this inheritance when we are dealing with this. If I have... And if I have a cat in this case, if I have a derived class, I can use the derived class with all its improved features perfectly. But there is one problem that is because of the nature of object orientation, you can always refer to or point to a derived class using the base pointer, base pointer or base reference. Because essentially a derived class is a type of uh, the base class, like cat is an animal. So you can refer to a cat as an animal. There is no problem with that. But we said because of this, you have to be careful when you have this type of thing, if you refer to a derived class using a parent's pointer or reference, it will forget that it's a derived class. It will act like, an, uh, like, the, like the base class. So it will forget all the improvements and everything from the base class happens. And that presented few problems for us, that when we have some, some kind of a feature like this, we said this type of, this type of
we said this type of this type of action that is, uh, you can see it at the back, right? This is uh, visible. Are we good? All right. And uh, so, yeah, so I, what I was saying was that uh, 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 doing so, we're going to have a problem because when you are uh, creating a dynamic object of type, of the derived type, in the pointer of the base type and you try to delete the base type because of the fact that I just mentioned to you, only the, 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 the base part will get wiped out and therefore we're going to have memory leak. Yes? Of course. How, so the question is, how, how a cat object can use an attribute of the base class? Yeah, so, so the attribute. That's, yeah, so you're saying how cat, because it doesn't have the name, can, it, can access the name? The answer is it can't. It's not supposed to because it's private. Yes. If you want a member attribute to be accessible to the child, you must put it in the protected area directly, of course. You must put it in a protected. In protected uh, access modifier, that uh, mname41 is still private to outsiders, but children have access to it, which is very bad. You're not supposed to do that. You don't let your child to uh, access your wallet. Otherwise, you're going to see that I have no money. Okay? So, so what I'm saying is that the proper way, an object-oriented way to access private properties of a base class is accessing them using the setters and getters of the base class. So how to access the name? Only through the function setter name and function getter name. You do not directly access it. That's wrong. That's bad design. Does that make, does that answer the question? Okay. So uh, you follow what the question, everybody got it what the question was, right? So inheritance, again, all, <sighs> why? Why going with all this gibberish and try to put all these restrictions on ourselves? Uh, the reason is that to be able to not have chaos and be able to do something with a big scope, you have to be extremely organized. Okay, if you have a, a sloppy room, you can still live in there and probably you can, uh, when you want to take a note, you can uh, go through the garbage and find the pen and, and a paper to take a note. <laughs> but it's going to take 10 times more than an organized person. An organized person, as soon as you want, are on the phone, you want to get the number, get the number, hold on, let me get a pen. And poof, the pen comes because the person knows where it is. But if you're a sloppy person and everything's piled up in your room and it says, let me get a pen, and then you're searching, where the heck did I put that pen? Okay, so organization, instructions, although it looks like that it's going to make your life more difficult, but eventually it's going to make your life much easier. The exact same thing happens over here. Structured programming was good when you had games like jumping jacks and a line with pads and something would ding dong do some arcade thingy. That's fine. But when you want to make something like Unreal Tournament that is like a world of its own and the characters are running around interacting with each other, it's like a, a virtual, like, or, or Imagine, uh, you've seen those Oculus VR things, right? Like the VR goggles. Have you ever put one of those things on? Oh, I'm going to bring it one day so you can see what the heck is going on. You put that thing on, you go to another world, literally. And I'm not joking. You go to another world. You really get into a world, a physical world exactly like ours, but virtual. So 
how can they manage such a thing if they don't do everything as we are talking about right now, if they, fo if they don't follow these type of restrictions to the point obsessively, it's going to be chaos and none of those things are going to work because somebody's going to change that name <laughs> because they have access to them. And suddenly you're going to see your character's name is different. <laughs> okay, and then you have to go find the bug. But if everything is organized, those restrictions those restrictions force you to stay put and design something proper that matches real world. Every single thing that you see in an object-oriented uh, design, not only programming, if you are doing object-oriented uh, architecture, if you're at architecture design, or any type of object-oriented object -oriented databases, any type of object-oriented system, because it tries to replicate our reality, it becomes easy to manage, and you can make it bigger as you go. So, sorry, that was a sh very short question, but I had to mention why we don't need to. So, as I mentioned, this caused, caused problem. Because of this fact and problem, we came up with a solution that guarantees that no matter what type of access you have to a derived class, the system guarantees that latest existing version of an action is going to get uh, invoked when oh. you are actually requesting it. So we said to fix the problem with, with to fix the problem with calling members uh, to, uh, to, to invoking actions of a uh, derived class using its base pointer or, or reference, we have a, a method of calling a polymorphic method, a polymorphic style of, of creating a, a method that is called a virtual method. When you flag any type of method virtual, when you flag any type of base method virtual, the descendants of that class, if they shadow or override those actions, it's guaranteed that no matter how the derived class is accessed, always the latest implementation of that method is called, no matter how far the inheritance goes. So you have a base class and you have 50 derived class back to back going down. If the first one is virtual, any point of entry within the hierarchy of inheritance points to the latest version of the method. So if my base class has a function called foo, and another derived class has a function foo, and another class has function foo, and it keeps going 100 times, if I go halfway through, point to the last one with the 50th, uh, base class that is in the middle, always the last one is called, okay? This is virtuality, and how do we do this? It's simply the, you, you go to your base, when you are designing a class, when you are designing the class, if the class, if the class is uh, being written to be derived from, and you should think that way, every function that you write, you must ask yourself, does this function, does this method need to get, might get uh, improved by a descendant? If that's the case, you make it virtual. In this case, I did it all. But if, for example, if I, say, if I say, I want the act to be updatable, that's virtual. I don't want move to be upda updatable. I remove the virtual, which means move cannot be updated. That's the end of it. But remember, if you make something virtual, that's it. You cannot take the virtuality away. It's transitive. It goes all the way to the end. But if you do not make a method virtual, that method remains like that. If you make a method virtual halfway through the inheritance, it becomes virtual after that. Everything after that becomes virtual. And these guarantee that the latest version is called. And because of that fact, I ask you to please, in your professional life or 
in school or wherever you are writing a C++ application. At any moment from now on, if you are creating the destructor, put a virtual in front of it. That virtual is dormant. It doesn't do anything if inheritance is not happening, so it doesn't cause any harm. But if the class is inherited, it guarantees that accidental memory leak is not going to happen, which means at any moment a derived class is created in any way and it's destroyed or deleted, it guarantees that the latest version of the destructor is called, which means the most derived class will be deleted and therefore everything is going to be gone and you're not going to have any error. Are we okay down to this point? And that was uh, what we talked about. And the last thing we said is that sometimes when we are actually designing a class, some of the uh, actions of the class are obvious that they have to exist, but we still don't know how. And our base class is created only for inheritance purposes and nothing else. You have a class that is created only to be a base, and it should not exist by itself. And that happens in, in everyday life. Every single class that is very ob obvious for you and you think it's something real you can touch, it's not. Every single thing that you think of, any generalized name that you put for something, you say glasses, my glasses. When you say glasses, it's not a specific thing. You cannot create glasses. You have to see what type of glass. It has to get inherited to uh, uh, a final uh, concrete class, to like a sunglasses. Is the sunglasses made? Uh, is it polarized? Is it not? So you have to go through specific type of thing to make it definite. Everything is like that. Okay? So animal is that case. Or for us, it's humans. So when we are all humans, but human, again, is not a concrete class. It's an abstract-based class because it, it, although its existence is imperative, but you only need a human class to be able to create concrete instances out of it through inheritance. The same thing with an animal over here. So if I think an animal should make a sound in some way, but I don't know how, that's when I make that thing a pure ritual. And if a class only has a pure, at least has one pure virtual method in it, that class becomes a base class by design. It can only serve as a base class and nothing else. When you put a pure virtual method inside the class, that class is not instanci instantiable anymore. You cannot instantiate it because it has an incomplete method in it that should be implemented later. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call an abstract base class. An abstract base class is a class that is only created to be a base class, and it cannot exist as its own. It has to get inherited and finalized to a concrete class. So what is a concrete class? A concrete class is a class that has all its methods implemented. It doesn't have a pure virtual method in it. So if I create another class out of animal and do not implement the sound, that derived class is still an abstract base class, even if I inherit it from this one. OK? So for example, from animal, I go bird. I create a bird out of an animal. So I'm going to uh, birds can fly. So we can do that. And, and put stuff like that. So we add bird to this one. But still, I don't know how a bird sounds. It has to be. It's a bodgy. It sounds like that. It's, it's a, I don't know. Whatever. So it, the, the, the sound of a bird is different depending on what species they are. So still, I cannot implement the sound. So the bird that is an inherited class from the animal is still an abstract base class and needs to get inherited into a concrete class. Otherwise, it cannot get created. So abstract-based classes can be derived from other classes if uh, uh, they do not implement everything entire. Are we OK down to this point? And this is where we stop. <coughs> questions? Any questions? Anything? I did a quick review on what we've talked about last time. In 
what, 30 minutes? So hopefully that made things fit. And hopefully hearing this, you can answer all the questions for the quiz properly, because that's, you don't need to know the virtuals, but only the inheritance part. Virtuals are next one, next quiz. Pardon me? No, you cannot. If something is virtual, it's doomed to remain virtual. Yes. Yes. So what happens is that if I create an animal, okay, if I create an animal that has doesn't add anything to an animal. So if I create, I inherit an animal, whatever, Gogligu, whatever the name of the animal is. If I inherit this one and only have one method in it called sound, then that becomes an that becomes a concrete animal. Okay. So if I create something out of this animal, let's say I create a cat, as I did, and I do not implement act, move, nothing, I, and I do not add the nine lives to it, nothing. The only thing I do is adding a sound. That's it, nothing else. Then it becomes a concrete class and it's, you can actually instantiate it. That's, that's how it works. Because everything else, although they are virtual, but they are, in, they are implemented. They are not pure. So the, the, the class becomes concrete. I, I remember we get an email like, oh, it's, it's, uh, let's put it this way. When you create So, how can I make this thing bigger? Resize, maybe. Just want to make it, there you go. So, when you create a class, this is the boundaries of your class, correct? That's the class that, that's my animal. It, it has all the stuff that an animal has. It has its name, all the actions and everything are in here. Are we okay with this? Any problem with this? Now, when I create, say, a cat, what happens? The very first thing ha that happens is that you are going to take this design, right? And then over this design, you are going to add extra features that makes this thing a cat. Do we understand this? So a cat is an animal with some extra stuff. Are we clear about this? Now when I'm looking at an animal, when I'm looking at, sorry, let me see if there is something in here that I can use. No, I have to use my Artistic, I don't know, and I don't have my pen, so I have to draw with the mouse. I apologize for the awkwardness of the, because uh, I forgot to bring my pen. Next time I'll bring it so I can actually draw with a pen. So what happens is that if I have something like this, so, so the red one is an animal. Are we, so we understand that, right? So let's actually do it so, so we understand exactly. Wow, that's too big. Uh, I think this would be good. So this is an animal. Wow, fancy animal. Okay. <laughs> And this one is going to be the cat. Are we okay with this down to this point? So when I say something like, uh, when I say something like, and I have to change the font because this really is not <laughs> the best font to write this thing. So let me just go something like, uh, C, 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 sure. Uh, this is good. Okay. So when I say something like cat pointer C is equal to new cat, okay? And in here, I am saying animal 
pointer A is equal to new animal. Okay? What happens is that this A pointer of mine, whatever this pointer is, so this A pointer of mine will point to the animal. Are we okay with this? The instance of the animal. When I create the cat, okay, the C pointer that I have, whatever that pointer is, the C pointer that I have, whatever that pointer is, that points to the cat. But the difference is that it points to the entire cat over here. Well, this is too narrow. It points to the entire cat. That is supposed to be an accolade. Uh, <laughs> okay, one more time. Do we understand this? If I actually create an animal pointer, so if I actually create something like this, if I say over here something like animal pointer um, AP is equal to new cat, if I actually do something like this, what happens is that this animal pointer of mine that is here will point only to the animal part of the cat, which is this one. Do we understand that? When you delete this one, what's going to get deleted? The whole thing. When you delete this one, what's going to get deleted? Only this part. So what remains in memory? Not cat, the cat extras. And that's leak. When you make it, when you make it virtual, when you delete this, it will see the whole instead of seeing only that. Yes. I want to relate the two. They have nothing to do with each other. Can we make use this to create an instance of an abstract class? First of all, your question is wrong. How can you create an unreal thing? An abstract base class is unreal. Yes. to understand I so you say if I have an abstract class abstract base class so you have an abstract base class correct an abstract base class is animal okay now go okay that's fine okay okay no you have an animal you have an abstract base class animal there is no cat now create one Nick, you can't. Because you said, can I create an instance of an abstract base class? When you are creating an instance of an abstract base class, there is no derived class. You may create a cat, but it doesn't know it's there. So, so, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, okay, so it's a concrete one. That's beautiful. Yes, of course. Uh, oh, oh, yes, that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's the whole purpose of it. Okay, and it guarantees that always the cat skull. Yeah, you're absolutely right. My apologies. Yeah, that is exactly what we are doing. Yeah, but making the destructor virtual makes sure that you're not going to have memory leak. That's all. But you're absolutely right. My apologies. No, no, no. See, 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 again, when we are dealing with inheritance, we should always make the destructor virtual. No. Every time you should make the destructor virtual, inheritance, no inheritance, nothing. As of this moment, the syntax of a destructor has a virtual in front of it. 
blindly do it. Okay? I mean, obsessively do it. Because if one day you do inheritance, you don't want to have memory leak. All right? Are we good? Yes, sir. To access the other one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, um, I have it right here. Why? The reason is this. You are creating a, a simulation that is supposed to drive cars in the road. And you have 50 cars in the road. Or a racing simulation that you have different cars in the road. Okay? You want to tell the cars to start racing. Or drive. Go. What are you going to do? You're going to, so yes, let's say there are 50 cars in the track. And, yeah. and each one is a different model. So how are you going to tell them go? You have to write 50 variables, write 50 lines of code, one by one tell them to go, right? Like this, I create an array of cars, and I put the address of all different models of cars in this one because they are all children of car. I put in a loop. And 1 to 50, I say, go. And they all go. All right? It's the same thing in here. So the, the example is right in this main. Why? This is the reason. Take a look. I am, make, I am telling all the animals to make a sound. Do I have four things back to back to do that? No. I write one loop of animals, and I tell to each animal to make a sound. Because the action is virtual, the animal will make its own sound. All right? Does that make sense? Perfect. That was a beautiful question. That's the whole purpose of virtuality. That's the beauty of virtuality. Let's put it that way. Questions? About anything, lab, whatever. We are done with the review and everything. If you have any questions about anything, let me know. I am yours in the next 16 minutes. Never. We don't have a studio coach ever. Oh, you're, so you're talking about when do we need to refer to a cat as an animal or refer to a cat as a cat? Yeah. Well, it all depends on your business logic. If you are in a zoo and you want to feed all the animals, then feeding an animal becomes a pure virtual method. And then each animal has different way of, way of being fed. One is going to be fed by meat. The other is going to be fed by seeds. The other one's going to, and so, so then in the zoo, you're going to put all the, anim, all the different animals in an array of animals because you want to feed them all. That's when you need to refer them, refer to all the animals in the zoo using the animal pointer. But if you only have a dog of your own at home, one dog that is yours and nothing else. You don't need pure virtual method. You don't need it. You just create an instance of a dog and it's a reference of a dog. You feed the dog. You don't need any virtuality. You don't need anything. There are no different types of things. Again, it all depends on your business logic. Okay? So zoo or just one dog at home. But if you have a dog and a cat at home and a baji, then you need the pointer because you have three different animals. Are we okay? Yes. Nothing, you had a pointer instead of reference. <laughs> Same thing, just syntax is different. With pointers, you have to use the arrow. With reference, you have to put the dot. References, references cannot exist without being referred to. Pointers can point to different ones as it goes. So you can change the, like if that R was pointer over there, you can later on point it to another animal. But if it's a reference, it dooms to be doomed to be the reference of D and nothing else. You cannot change the reference. That's the only difference. Anything else? Oh, that's, that's tough. That's, again, it's too 
early for us to know it. You're saying when we are doing it, when we are doing something like this, uh, sorry, here, what does this public mean, right? So just, uh, you don't need to know it. I'm just going to give you a very quick answer. It changes the access modifiers in the child. So you, you can just ignore what I just, I'm saying, just ah, bah, 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 to do that, 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 like that, don't hear it, okay? But just mentioning it very quickly. So for example, if I, want, if I, if I uh, inherited privately, then all the public methods of the parent become private in the child which means afterwards if you create a child you cannot access the public methods of the parent. If you do it protected, it goes one down. So all the publics become private, all the protecteds and privates become private. We don't want to know that. Okay? <laughs> so it, it changes the access modifier in the child. You, you are telling, I want, the, I want all the public stuff in the parent to become protected in the child. Then you do it. Yeah, yeah. So, but just ignore it. So that's what it. That's what it is. There is no application. There is no way for for me to be able to create a workshop that demonstrates that. It's too rich for our blood. It's too difficult uh, to to be able to handle it. So, yes. When you said like protected is closer to public, uh, and it's closer to private too. So it's halfway through. No, no, you can mess. Like, the, you will see, I think it's in, in your project, one of the classes, base classes that you have in a project actually has a protected member, member fun, uh, pr protected attribute. Because some attributes, you want to give access to the child to it. Again, it all depends on your design. If an attribute is OK to be accessed by a child, then you let it be. It's, it's your choice. You can actually do it. Again. It all depends on, on it. It is making making a, a protect a pro making a protected uh, creating a protected uh, uh, creating a protected attribute is not a bad design, depending on your uh, design, depending on your business logic. You don't make everything protected just in case. That's awful. But if you are doing, going through your design and says, wait a minute, this is impossible. I need to have access to that thing for yada, yada, yada. Then you make it protected, okay, when you reach that point. Protect just in case. Any just in case scenario is awful in program programming. You have to do it, do it on needing, uh, when you need it only. Yes, you can. Of course you can. Oh, yeah. If you don't want to create, like they say, the class becomes bloated when you have too many access modifiers. When you create a set setter and getter act access modifier that is only returning an attribute and setting an attribute with no logic. See, a setter and getter, you need only if you want to limit the access to something. Like for example, I have an age for a person. I'm going to create a setter for the age because I want the age to be set between 1 and 100. So I need to fiddle with it. I should not let people to set it to anything. And a getter, something like that, right? But when I have, say, let's say, for example, some value, I don't know, some kind of an attribute that I do not need to know any supervision for its setting or getting, then I even can make that attribute public if I need to. I should not put a setter and getter for it. Setter and getters are to enforce logic to set and get the values of your attributes. If you don't have any logic, there is no need for it. You follow what I'm saying? Just think about like think about the design. If you see, okay, I'm going to make this private just in case. Again, just in case stuff. Not good. I'm going to make this thing private and create a setter and getter for it. But setter will just return the value. Get, uh, getter will return the value and setter will set it with no uh, filtering. 
And why? I know, because we are trying to teach you what a setter and getter is. It's not that the case, but just I'm just letting you know, okay? Um, if you have a setter and get, but for example, uh, you if you have like for example that age, if you want to get someone's age, you don't need any filter. You just want to see what this age is. But when you want to set the age, you have to have a filter to make sure it's valid, correct? Then you have to make it protector and create the setter and getter. Although only setting it requires supervision, not getting it, or vice versa. Okay, it, it all depends. If anything, then if any, mo any supervision is needed for modifying an attribute, you need setter and getters. Otherwise, just it bloats it. And uh, most of the time, you don't even need a setter and getter out there for a private thing. Usually when an attribute is private, it's private so it can be used as an internal engine of the class. You're not supposed to have setter and getters for it. You follow what I'm saying? Like if, like for example, you put a name for a human being, you don't need to put a setter for that. Because a human being, when it comes to being, it, it will be given a name. The constructor has a name. Why do you need to change someone's name? For example, depending on business logic again. All right? But student numbers need to be set and get. Because you have, no, actually that, no, that, that, that's not. That's the case. Do you issue a student number and domains? That was a good, grade, yeah. Grade can be changed. Thank you. Grade for, a, for an assessment. That needs a setter and getter. Because you have to be able to set it. You have to be able to change it. You have to be able to display it in different ways. All right. OK, the uh, quiz starts in six minutes. Make sure you have your computers, uh, Seneca computers ready, and your own computers off exactly at 9.13. Okay, so in, in, in four minutes, we're going uh, to uh, turn off our laptops and only stay on the. So this is the first time we are, we are doing it. Uh, I will see what happens. So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, so go to quizzes. Do you see quizzes here? Yeah. So you can, because it's not, uh, yeah, it's not available. So it will be available at 9.15, right? 9.15, it's going to be available. Uh, I just, so that feature is working. <laughs> All these things have changed in the new Blackboard, so I really don't know how it works. So, All right, so Abna, can you hear me? I can. All right, beautiful. So, so you heard what I just said about 50 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. So, I'm ready. If you have any questions, I'm all yours. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I have to. I have to check. Go we'll ask ChatGPT. <laughs> no, there's. I, have, I haven't used it. I never had that. Uh, do I need? Do we need CN? CN. I don't know. I seriously don't know. I created many when I when I want to. I inherit it. To, to things that are so you can simply inherit the ice stream to what you want and do add features to it. You can do that, but no, I don't. I don't. I don't recall. Well, so the the correct answer is I don't know. Find out and let the class know. Uh, C in is standard input. It's console input. It stands for console input. And console is keyboard. So, I stream is a, is a base class. So when they inherit an F stream, then it's not console anymore. So it's it's input stream. So it can be used for many things. And they inherited it to more stuff. We have, believe it or not, you can read from a, a C stream. So 
iStream has, so when you said C in has other instances, I, I, saying no, um, saying I don't know is for C in that is purely iStream. By the way, iStream's constructor and OStream's constructor is private. It means you cannot instantiate them. They get instantiated in a special way. You're going to learn it in OP345. There are classes that you're not allowed to instantiate them. Okay, iStream is one of those. And OStream is one of those. You can, if you try, that's why you cannot pass iStream and OStream by value. It has to be by reference. Because they cannot get, inst you cannot create new instances out of them. Okay? It's not allowed that uh, all the constructors are private. Okay? So either private or deleted. You know, to equal to delete, it means I don't want this to happen. So, uh, but we have several versions of iStream that they do different types of input. One of which are uh, file that you receive from a file. Another one is uh, uh, an stream input where you can actually read from a, a C string. So you have a C string and you want to parse the C strings. So you have a string and inside that string you have series of numbers and stuff and you want to read them. So you have Character one, character one, character point, character five. So it's 11.5. You want to read that as a double? You can do that using iStream version that reads from a string. So you can parse a string using iStream if you want to, if you know what is the meaning of parsing. The are, the, yes, but your input is a character array. Right. So it will have array of course it will. It's iStream. It has everything that iStream has. Why not? It's an iStream. You, do you, what do you think you are creating when you're typing your keyboard? It's a character array that is coming from your keyboard. Character. Yes, it does. Exactly like C in. Yes, if, if, you, if you use that functionality, if you use the extraction operator yeah. as you do for, uh, yeah, ex extraction operator as you do from CN, then it will have that buffer. If you are not using the extraction, if you are using the read function, you don't know what is that. Actually, CN and out they have read and write function. But if you actually use the read function, then it doesn't. So again, remember inheritance. When you inherit something from something, you can't say this this time the function will not do. Yeah, it will do that because it's the same function. It's the parent's function. And yeah. There is no problem. That's by design. It's a beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Quiz started. Oh, quiz started. Quiz started. Quiz started. Quiz started. Quiz started. Quiz six. Quiz six started. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Quiz six started. Please st start. Mm -hmm. Do it. Install it. Install it. You don't have time for it. I told you it's an experiment. If it doesn't work, we're going to do the quiz again. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we're not going to do it. We're going to do the quiz again. Did you click on open? What is it? Unable to store information to register. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now click OK and see if it works or not. I just want to see if it works or not. If it worked, beautiful. If it didn't, I'm not going to do it. Just click OK and, and next. OK? And keep going. Yeah. yeah. OK? Really? All right. So it sucks. Let me see if I can actually take it up. <laughs> Lebna, could you do it at home on your computer? I have the app downloaded, but it does not, it doesn't open the quiz. Oh. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. So let me see if I can modify the quiz. 
Everybody okay. stay off your computers. Let me see. I wanted to see if lockdown browser works, so it was too good to be true, apparently. So it didn't work. So everybody off your computers. Let me see if I can actually modify it. <laughs> lockdown browser is a good thing. It means you, you don't use anything. You don't do anything else. So. All right. Give me a second, please, everybody. Give me a second, please. It worked on my laptop, so. <laughs> All right, so let me see if I can. Try it again, please. Quiz number six, restart from scratch. And if it works. And let me know if everything's good. <coughs> Did it work? All right. Where the devil is the computer? Oh, here is the computer. Ah, da -da -da -da. Let me turn this on. It's working now. All right, good, thank you. So please start. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at your monitors, so um, you make sure that nothing else is open other than that one. If I see anything is open on your monitors, I'm looking at them from here, okay? So I have all your monitors in front of me. Uh, you open something and I'm gonna close your computer down, shut it down, and then the end of your quiz. So.
hear people talking.